Right. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I hope you can all hear me OK. Uh, my name's Alice Parfit. I work for um, Bug Life and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, insect pollinators this evening. Um, if you've got questions, pop them in the ask a question box at the bottom and I will do my best to answer some of those um, at the end. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen now with you all. Um, and let's see if we can get right. Let's share that with you. Right. Hopefully you can all see that. It's a little bit strange as I now can't see myself. Um, but yes, yeah, so this evening I am going to talk to you about our insect pollinators bug life bee lines project and how you can get involved and help. And it's really lovely to be here this evening to be part of this natural history um, uh, event, making natural history event, sorry. Um, so I uh, work for Bug Life, as I um, said, and we are a national invertebrate conservation charity. And we're actually the only organisation in Europe that's devoted to the conservation of all invertebrates, so not just pollinating insects. And I am currently working on a, a project called the Changing Chalk, which is a National Lottery Heritage Funded Partnership project. It's led by um, the National Trust and, um, as I said, funded through the National Lottery. And we're working on the chalk grassland landscape of the eastern downs of Sussex. So I know some of you will be from Sussex, but some of you aren't. Um, and it's all about improving the chalk grassland and also connecting people with nature. So this evening, I am going to give you a talk about um, our insect pollinators. Um, so who they are, why they're important, what they need through the whole of their life cycles, um, why they're declining and how you can get involved and how you can help them. So very, very first up, really, um, I just need to say, you know, what is pollination? And very simply, that is just the movement of pollen from one flower to another. So that enables fertilisation and therefore um, seed production. Um, so very important, obviously, for a lot of um, plants and crops. So it's estimated that 80 percent of British wild plants are pollinated by insects. But insect pollination is also really important for growing our food. Um, perhaps if you have an allotment or grow your own vegetables, you'll know that companion planting, for example, can be really good for increasing um, the yield of your vegetables or the quality. And it's estimated that 75% of all crops that we grow in the UK are insect pollinated. So that's actually a huge amount. So first up, we are going to um, meet some of our pollinators. So there are about 6,000 species of insect pollinator in the UK, and that includes um, species that you probably think about if you think about insect pollinators, so our bees and maybe our wasps, but also uh, butterflies and moths um, can provide this service, as can flies, particularly our hoverflies, and beetles as well. And I think it's also just worth pointing out here that as well as it providing this really important service, um, they have their own intrinsic value and beauty. And hopefully some of you, if you've come on this talk, um, like insects as well. So first up, we have our bumblebees. So um, this is quite a small group. Um, of our pollinators actually with just six, um, six, 25 species in the UK and they're probably the ones that we are most familiar with sort of in our gardens and green spaces. Um, their life cycle is that the queens overwinter as adults so they're often the first and last species we see on the wing so for example the common car the bee in the middle uh, top there um, I can still see that in my garden on warm days. It's been a nice day in Sussex today, so that was out in, in my garden still. 
But as well as our bumblebees, we also have solitary bees. Um, and there are many, many more of these species. So they're really important um, as pollinating insects. So uh, I mentioned that the bumblebees, we have 25 species in the UK. And there are over 225 species of um, solitary bee. So lots, lots more. Um, they have slightly different life cycles and then therefore requirements from bumblebees. Um, but they're still really, really important pollinators. Um, so in my garden, for example, on this selection, I can see hairy footed flower bees, ashy mining bees and wool carder bees. Sadly, I don't see the others in my garden, um, but just to sort of um, show there's a really sort of good selection um, that are out and about there. So flies are also really important, especially our hoverflies. Hoverflies are my absolute favourites. That's what I really like. And that's sort of how I've um, got into uh, pollinating insects, really. Um, there are around 280 species in the UK often considered the gardener's friend, as um, you might know that some of them feed on aphids, so they're very good at sort of pest control. And many of them are very good mimics of um, bees and wasps. Um, and you can sort of see that some of them here I have the good stripes and can be very furry like bees. But the big difference is that flies have one pair of wings, whereas bees have two. So moving on to our butterflies and moths, um, 59 species approximately of butterfly um, in the UK, plus a few migrants. But again, it's the moths, moths that um, are in really huge numbers. We've got over two and a half thousand species of moth. And um, although they are out at night, they can be really important pollinators feeding on different flowers. Um, the adults of butterflies and moths feed on nectar. Um, they don't need the pollen at all, but they um, do move the pollen around, so provide that pollination service. So what do our pollinating insects need? Um, they need food for when they're adults, but also food for the larvae. Um, and this is probably what we think about food for insects. If we think, what well, what can we do to help? That's probably something that comes to mind immediately. But as well as food, they also need somewhere to breed safely. They need somewhere to shelter and overwinter. And finally, they also need a mosaic of these habitats. And I'll come back to that in a little more detail in a moment. So what do our adults and larvae feed on? Well, they have a, a wide range of feeding habitat habits. Sorry. Firstly, um, most of the adults um, need flowers, and that's what we would think of when we think about pollinating insects. So they need those as a source of protein-rich pollen and sugar-rich nectar. And most of our pollinating insects um, need both of those, but not all of them, as I mentioned butterflies and moths, they will just need the nectar, but they can move the pollen around as well. And then the size and the shape of our pollinating insects is really important, um, as well as some of the morphology, like length of tongue. Um, and these all dictate which sorts of flowers they can actually use. And to suit a wide range of pollinators, um, a mix of open flowers and also deeper flowers are needed um, to um, for, for the most pollinators to, to get benefit. So um, different pollinators use different types of plants. Our hoverflies, for example, um, so hoverflies are on the top um, row of this, this slide. On the top right, we've got, um, throw that one in there, is uh, the hoverfly that's called the Batman hoverfly because on its thorax, it's supposed to look like a uh, the silhouette of, of Batman. So you have to look quite co closely, but it is there. That's a nice common um, uh, hoverfly that you can find all sorts of places in your gardens and green spaces and that sort of thing. So hoverflies lack the specialised mouth parts and parts, and so like to visit flowers where pollen and nectar 
are easy to get to. So this is sort of open flowers, things like umbellifers, thistles, knapweeds, that sort of thing. Um, butterflies, on the other hand, have um, long proboscis, as you can see uh, the uh, silver spotted skipper feeding on the bottom left there. Um, so they can get into quite deep flowers to um, get the nectar. Um, so something you can sort of see on Buddleia, for example, um, in your garden. The bees have um, a wide range of flowers that they visit. Some species can collect pollen and nectar from a very wide range um, of plants. Other uh, species, such as the large scabious mining bee, which we can see on the um, South Downs, just uh, outside Eastbourne, um, quite a rare bee, but they collect um, pollen from just a few closely related um, species, in this case just the scabiuses, so they're a little more selective in the plants that they will go to. And then a few species of bee collect just one species, of um, collect their pollen from just one species of plant, and there's only a few of these, um, for example the very aptly named yellow loose strife bee only collects pollen from the plant from of yellow loose strife. So also um, within bumblebees, they have uh, different length tongues and they also have uh, different length faces. Um, so that dictates which plants that it, they can use. So for example, our garden bumblebee is one of the long tongued um, types of, of bumblebee. Um, and therefore, it can feed on flowers that are um, that are deep, and so they feed on flowers such as foxgloves or bluebells, or maybe comfrey, which you might have in the garden. And conversely, early bumblebees are a short-tongued um, species, so they will feed on more open flowers. Um, however, they have a very good trick up their sleeve in that they can also uh, nectar rob. And to do this, they bite a hole in the bottom of a deep flower that they can't access normally. So they bite um, a hole in the bottom and access the nectar that way. Um, it's also really important to think about having food for our pollinators throughout the season. Um, different species are active at different times of year. So some species are the adults are active for just a really short period to coincide with the particular flower that they use. And then other pollinators can be active for a long period um, during the summer season or maybe have several generations during that time. Um, and this all means that a continuity of flowers is really important for them so that they have food throughout the season. So trees and shrubs are often really important early on. I've got blackthorn um, showing uh, in the top left here, but things like willows can be really important. Blackthorn in sort of April time um, can be really sort of buzzing with insects um, because basically it's it's the only thing that's flowering. Um, at that time of year. But other sort of beneficial plants are things like dandelions, beds, nettles, ground ivy can be really good too. And then as summer progresses, some of the legumes and daisies and, and umbellifants, uh, um, umbellifers become really important, um, as do things like brambles, thistles, hogweed can be very good as well. But they also, uh, many of our insects go um, are active late into the season um, and that's sort of when ivy bees uh, can come along onto the ivy and wasps and ivy is a, a really fantastic late season uh, resource providing that vital final feast for overwintering adults. So this is just a really quick recap of some of the plants that I've, I've mentioned, some of the top pollinator plants. Um, and these are sort of wild plants. You can incorporate them into uh, green spaces and gardens as well. But these are things that you'll find in the countryside. So um, uh, trees and shrubs early on, really important. 
legumes such as bird food, birds foot trefoils and fetches can be really important clover can be very important and then sort of their more open flowers things like oxide daisy scabious mallow mallows cow parsley can be very very good but we also need to think about um what larvae feed on so that's the uh, immature stages of of our pollinating insects um many larvae of butterflies moths and some flies as well uh, feed on plant stems, leaves and roots. Um, many, particularly some of our butterfly uh, species, only feed on one particular plant. So, for example, we have the small blue butterfly um, down here in Sussex and the caterpillars are very fussy and just feed on kidney veg. Um, and so others are a bit more um, generalist in the um, plants that they will eat. Some of our pollinators, particularly hoverflies, their larval stages will um, feed on um, other things. So things like aphids I mentioned a little bit earlier um, on. So a really good one to attract to your garden. Um, and some of them, uh, the larvae are actually predatory as well. So, uh, for example, feeding on wasp or ant larvae. So that's um, a little look at what some of the... Um, adults and larvae need to survive but um, having the food source in isolation is is not everything um, we also need to think about what sort of habitats they need um, to complete their whole life cycle so somewhere for them to breed where they can uh, lay their eggs and they, again a variety of habitats because we're talking about pollinating insects um, generally a variety of habitats um, are needed um, it might be that they use dead wood or they're in the soil or uh, mortar in walls or grassy tussocks. Long grass can be important, dead wood. Um, many of our hoverflies need water to breed in or dead and decaying uh, vegetation matter that's often um, at the edge of water in a, in a damp place. Um, and Many species um, actually lay their eggs on very specific um, plant hosts, um, but others are much more general, as I said. So just having a mixture of long grass and sort of short grass and sort of turf and bare areas can be really um, important. So some of our bees uh, use very different areas to nest in. Uh, bumblebees, uh, that's a bumblebee nest on the top left hand um, side they tend to use old mammal holes um, that can be underground or in sort of uh, grassy tussocks or long grass or perhaps tree holes solitary bees um, as there are more species tend to have a greater variety of nest sites some need bare ground so this is the ivy bee in the uh, top middle um, using a uh, bare ground and that might be um, on the flat it might be uh, on bare slopes so bottom middle we've got uh, a really nice chalk bank that has got short short grass and bare areas um, which can be really good for some or it might be vertical faces um, some of our species have uh, slightly different requirements for laying their eggs so uh, our red-tailed mason bee on the bottom left here, um, they lay their eggs in snail shells. So there's only a couple of species that actually do this, but their requirements are quite particular. However, uh, on the bottom right-hand side, we have the red mason bee, and these nest in a variety of pre-existing holes, cavities, uh, it can be large beetle holes in wood, hollow plant stems as, um, such as bramble can be very important. And this is actually the species that you are most likely to see in your garden if you have a bee hotel, for example. Um, pollinating insects also need somewhere to shelter from the elements and somewhere to overwinter successfully. And many of the habitats that we just thought about uh, in um, areas where they can breed are also important for overwintering um, sites too. Um, many hoverflies 
overwinter as pupa, um, often well hidden in the soil or leaf litter. So just having that vegetation can be very important. Bumblebees often hibernate in north facing banks uh, with soft soil or maybe hedge and ditch banks and also dead wood. Um, solitary bees can uh, overwinter as pupa in, in a, yes, a wide range of these situations too. And finally, it's worth um, just saying that many of our, our pollinators need a mosaic of habitats for them to complete their life cycle. So we looked at the hoverflies that need water um, to lay their eggs in, but then need uh, pollen and nectar to feed on as adults. Some of our insects need this in very close proximity to one, to one another. Um, some of our solitary bees don't move very far in their lifetime at all. So having them close together can be really important. Some of our hoverflies can move um, a lot further. Some of them, in fact, are, are migratory. So actually um, go vast differences, vast distances, sorry. Um, but um, yes, yeah, some need them really close. So it's really important to sort of think about how we can um, have all of these habitats in a, in a smallish area. So we've had a little look at who our pollinating insects are. Um, so what is the problem? Well, the State of Nature report of 2013 stated that 60% of all our UK species are in decline, and this includes invertebrates. And it's estimated that over 1,200 invertebrates have become extinct in the last UK, last 100 years in the UK alone. Um, in the latest State of Nature report of 2019, it was um, estimated that 12% of all of the invertebrates that were assess assessed are at risk of becoming extinct. So we know that there are real problems um, for some of our invertebrates and pollinating insects in particular. And there's lots of reasons why um, pollinators have declined. Um, the first is the loss of wildflower rich grassland. So that's all that pollen and nectar resource that um, adults need. So over 97% of wildflower meadows have disappeared and about 80% of chalk, chalk grassland has gone since World War II. And unfortunately, much of what is, what is left is small in size and rather fragmented. And this again comes back to um, pollinating insects needing uh, those resources all close together. Pesticides are also a real problem for pollinating insects, um, as is climate change, which has really contributed to the fragmentation of suitable habitat for them. So if all of this sounds a little bit depressing, um, there are things that we can do, but we need to have a national approach to reversing declines in pollinators. And um, we need to be able to increase the amount of flower rich habitat. We need to connect pollinator habitats across both urban and rural, in, rural environments. Um, and this is how Bug Life came up with its Bee Lines project. And the Bee Lines project is really about wildflower rich habitats, connections through our landscape. And it's really an imaginative um, and beautiful solution. It's a, a series of insect pathways running through our countryside and towns um, along which we can restore and create a series of wildflower rich stepping stones. Um, and the idea is they will link existing wildflower, wildlife rich areas together already. Um, and they will benefit uh, uh, bees and butterflies and hoverflies, but also a host of other wildlife as well. And for those of you that are um, in Sussex, this is our um, bee lines map for Sussex that was mapped with many partners um, a few years ago. And for those of us are, that are in um, the Eastbourne area or the uh, Eastern part of the South Downs, this is what it looks like. And you can see that um, certainly the bit along the bottom follows the South Downs because this is a really important area for many of our pollinating um, insects. But if you're not on a bee line, um, don't worry. There are still loads of ways to get involved um, and, and help pollinators. 
So we're going to have a little look at what we can all do to help our pollinating insects. And the first thing is to um, really look after any of our existing flower rich areas. Um, this might be up on the South Downs, as this photo is. This is um, a fantastic place, not too far from, from the Eastbourne area, which is um, rich in all sorts of wildlife, but has lots of um, lots of our pollinating insects and also has actually lots of rare bees um, as wasps as, as well. But also um, coming down to the scale where maybe some of us can get involved and help, gardens can be really important for all wildlife, not just our pollinators. Um, they can provide a really good network of varied habitat and and offer a sanctuary either from the urban environment or indeed from intensively farmed um, environment. And their potential is enormous. Um, there's an estimated 16 million gardens in the UK um, and added up this comes up to half a million hectares, which when you think about it like that is just an amazing amount. And if we all gardened with wildlife in mind, we'd make a real difference to much of our wildlife. So what are the sorts of things you can do in your garden? Well, you can consider cutting the lawn a little bit less often. And this allows species such as dandelions or clovers come through, providing a really good um, source of that pollen and nectar that we need. If you um, are thinking, oh, gosh, that's that's a bit much. I like my lawn. You could try it in a, a small area and um, see how that happens. Um, you might um, want to create uh, a wildflower area or a, or a, or a mini meadow. Um, it might be that if you relax your uh, mowing regime, then perhaps um, you'll actually find some really nice flowers come through anyway. Um, but you might also need to do some sowing of um, seed. And to do that, you might either have to remove some of the turf or perhaps cut the lawn really, really short and then um, scarify it. It's important that um, you get the seed in contact with some soil. Um, or you might have some nice plants already in your lawn and you could supplement that with some um, plug planting of, of interesting plants that you would uh, like. But the important thing to remember with this, if you go down this route, is that um, you need to mow them in the autumn and all of those cuttings need to be um, taken away. Um, if you leave them on site, it just builds the nutrients up and that's definitely not what our wildflowers like. Um, other things you can do, you can plant a tree, um, maybe a, a fruit tree, and then uh, the pollinating insects are getting their nectar and pollen and you can get some fruit at the end of it as well. Um, you can get fruit trees for all sizes of gardens, um, but that's a quite a good early sort of um, pollen and nectar uh, source for your garden. And I should also say that some of our more formal planting can be good for pollinators too, as long as you choose the right plants. So here we've got a nice mix of um, rudbeckias and asters, nice open plants. So really good for a wide range of our pollinating insects. So a quick recap of some of our good cultivated plants that you might want to plant in your garden. We talked about the fruit trees there, but we've also got sort of our fruit bushes. So um, raspberry and gooseberry can be really good. Uh, the open flowers um, that can be good, things like poppies or hellebores or sunflowers. And then um, think about the species that like the deep flowers, things like comfrey is really good. Um, and then some of our um, herbs are, are excellent too. So you've got thyme and mint and, and lavender there as well. So some general advice for wildlife um, gardening is don't be too tidy. Leave some areas unmanaged, even if it's just a small area of your garden. And this comes back to providing those really important areas for overwintering um, breeding habitats um, that we mentioned uh, before. Um, also, 
avoid the use of pesticides in your garden if at all possible i would say don't use them um, at all um they are not good for insects at all and um yeah just try not to use them so you can also um do some things um as well as providing sort of good pollen and nectar, you can also do some things for um, some artificial sort of things for um, providing some um, some homes for our, our insects. Um, you can put a bee hotel up and these are great for some of our solitary bees. Um, and they're brilliant if you have one up in your garden just to sit and watch. You can buy them from all sorts of places or you can make your own. All you need is some holes drilled into some wood holes of different sizes are, are always good um but just make sure that they're the holes are smooth and free of splinters um and then you just pop them in a sunny position um and enjoy them i have one in my garden um i get lots of red mason bees use it and a few leaf cutter bees and they're brilliant um i also mentioned before about hoverflies needing um to lay their eggs in aquatic uh, environments, often in sort of decaying uh, vegetation. So um, this is a really good one you can do. You can create a, a hoverfly lagoon. It's a brilliant one to do with kids as well if you want to get them involved. All you need is a container with some um, sort of decaying organic matter and some water um, and you'll see hoverflies use it. And then if your kids want to get really interested, they can um, count all of the rat-tailed larvae that you can find in there. Um, there's also a really good project run by Sussex University called the Buzz Club, which is all about um, getting people involved in hoverfly lagoons, and you can actually monitor them, uh, really important. Um, yeah, you can, uh, yes, you can sort of uh, monitor them uh, as well, sorry. Um, other things you can do is um, have some water in your garden really important for many of our wild pollinators to lay their eggs as we've just said um, but they're also good for all sorts of wildlife so our dragonflies and damselflies can breed there we've got a nice little frog there as well wetland um, plants are also really good forage for our, our pollinators um, and also water is really good for um, thirsty insects so um, really important all around and it doesn't again doesn't matter the size a tiny um mini pond can be really really beneficial so these are the sorts of things you can do in your gardens to contribute towards bug life uh, bug life's bee lines project but we also want to think about what sort of things we can do in our green spaces school grounds and any sort of um public spaces um for our pollinators um many of the things uh, we've already talked about um to do in your garden can be sort of related to green spaces. So um, I would encourage everyone to get involved with their councils or community groups and um, see what can be done in those spaces too. Again, leaving long grass in less formal areas is a really easy one to do. And here um, paths have been mown through, so it looks very deliberate and tidy, which can often be um, a really important point because some people think um, when we leave things a bit longer they're uncared for but this shows us this is this is very um, deliberate and again in um, formal gardens see if some of the areas can be cut a little bit higher and who knows uh, what might come up churchyards and cemeteries can be um, really important um, for this and they're they're often on species rich grassland and they haven't had any um, either pesticides or um, nutrient levels improve. So they can often be really, really good places for all sorts of um, wildflowers. Um, if there's not much floral resource around, then it would be great to do some areas of wildflower planting. Um, this is uh, an excellent area here. So we've got a nice perennial um, mix that was planted in this park. So you can see some nice umbellifers there. Um, um, but it's a mix of perennial um, plants and grasses. So that's a really nice um, mix of that floral resource and some long grass um, for um, uh, other species. Um, and also we've got a nice hedgerow there and some mature trees. So really 
we're covering all of those requirements um, that uh, or the pollinators need through all of their life cycles. And this sort of thing is really good for local people, communities to get involved with. Um, we've had lots of projects uh, where people have helped create meadows, so a bit of cutting and raking of, of a meadow here uh, in preparation for, I think this was for some, um, some planting, um, but also in community orchards doing some plug planting to enhance the grassland, get a bit more floral diversity can be uh, really good. And again, if we can encourage um, our councils um, and anyone else really to just leave some areas to grow wild. Um, this is um, a great spot of um, hogweed and a bit of bramble um, that is absolutely brilliant for, for pollinators. So, so areas of this are really, really important as well. Um, and this is one that we can do either in our garden or green spaces if any trees need to have work on them, <clears throat> excuse me, for health and safety reasons, for example. Then leave the stumps. That's a really good source of, of dead wood. Leave some of the um, uh, cuttings or the logs in situ um, and that will be home for all sorts of insects, not just our pollinating insects. I'll also quickly mention um, bee banks or butterfly banks as they're sometimes called, although I think someone from Butterfly Conservation is giving a talk later in the festival about bee banks, so they'll probably go into much more depth than I will here. Um, but here we've got a, a natural uh, bee bank and an, an artificial one. So these artificial ones are great for in our parks um, and green spaces. They don't need to be too big. Um, but they need to be constructed uh, somewhere that's uh, in a sunny spot. So it's nice and warm, sheltered, often in, in a sort of crescent shape. And they can be planted for wildflowers. And then they provide brilliant spots for uh, pollinators for their, to get their nectar and pollen, somewhere to bask and keep warm, and also nesting opportunities for some of our bees. Also, I wanted to say that really no space is too small. So this is a really nice example of um, just an area in a car park that has been planted up. Um, we've got some lavender, some sort of, um, I think, fennel in the background there. So a nice open um, umbellifer, nice mix, um, not too much um, upkeep on this one, but will provide a really good uh, resource for our pollinating insects. So hopefully that's given you a little flavour of the sorts of things that you can do both in your garden and in green spaces to help our pollinators. Um, and if you do any of these, it would be absolutely fantastic to um, get you to pop them on to our website where we are collecting um, uh, all of the wonderful work that's going on. We're, we're basically trying to map all of the wonderful work that's happening on the bee lines. So if you do anything, it can be in your garden, it can be in your park. Um, you can submit something uh, onto our website, submit your details, um, upload a photo. And then the idea is that we will just have this lovely network that anybody can look at and we can see all the wonderful work that is going on. So there's a bit more information on bee lines there on our website. And that's basically the end of my talk. So thank you very much for listening. I'll go over um, uh, to the chat in a minute and we'll see what's um, on there. But also I'll just share that slide with you there. That's got a bit more information um, on all of the sort of advice that you can get on various bits, like how to do a hoverfly lagoon. Uh, Bug Life's website has got loads of um, information, both on our sort of community group guidance and on our habitat management, all about how to create wildflower areas, how to do this in your community. So lots and lots of information there as well. So thank you very much for listening, everybody. I am now going to uh, stop sharing my screen. So hopefully we'll come back to me and we'll see what the questions are.
Right. Okay, is has anybody got uh, oh, I can see at the bottom we've got asked a question. I'm going to go on there. Ah, right. So someone has, has asked, I'll, I'll, I'll answer this one first of all. Um, tree bumblebees have appeared quite recently and have become quite common. I don't, I'm going to be perfectly honest, I don't know why they are doing well. Um, but yes, they are, they are definitely um, doing well. Um, I've found them in, you know, all sorts of places, you know, um, I do a bit of dormouse monitoring, they're, they're there. So I, I'm afraid I can't actually answer that one. I don't, I don't know the answer. Um, someone else has also asked, are there any pollinators active at this time of year? Um, and yes, there are still some nice sunny days. I actually walked past um, some ivy that was in full sunshine today. It's been a nice sunny day in Sussex today um and that was had um lots of wasps on so quite a few of our, our wasps are still active um there were lots of flies um uh, but there were also a few hoverflies so i saw um two of our um some of our common ones which are marmalade hoverflies um and i also saw a common cardaby and i'm sure i heard uh, one of the big queen bumblebees um the queen bumblebees over over winter um and um so they can be active when it's warm almost any any time of of year so hopefully that answers that one so thank you for that question um do you have to be on an actual bee line to be able to create a bee lines project absolutely not um these are just areas um where that have been mapped that are have existing areas of really good um, wildflower rich um, habitat that we want to sort of link up. But any of this work can be done um, absolutely anywhere and it will be of benefit to pollinators. So no, absolutely, wherever you are, um, I'm not on a on a pollinator, on a beeline where I am, but I do lots of stuff in my garden for pollinators because I, I love them. Um, someone else has asked if the slides will be available after the session. I believe they will be. Um, um, so I'll, I will say yes, and I think so. Um, I think signs are really good to show people why if you left. Ah, yes. Yeah, so that's basically someone has, has sort of said that it's good to have some signage up to say why um, perhaps long grass has been um, left. And I think, yes, that's an excellent idea. Um, I don't think we have any particular bee lines um sign sort of generic ones but we certainly have used them in projects where we have done some wildflower planting or something like that so i don't think there's generic ones available but yes i do think that's um, a really good sign and perhaps if you were talking with the council or something like that that would be something um something to suggest as well so yes definitely um, um Right, I'm just going to read this one. Someone has asked, do I have any information regarding soil temperatures? Uh, some, ah, yes, so someone is saying they've got some rare invertebrates whose habitat will be destroyed by change in soil temperature by the building of a tall tower that's going to cast shade. Um, certainly a lot of... Um, um, certainly a lot of our pollinators need to bask and warm up to be active. Certainly true of butterflies, you'll often see them basking first, um, first thing in the morning and certainly bees, they all need to warm up. And also we saw you see many more um, uh, pollinating insects on, on the wing on nice warm days rather than cold days. So yes, I think actually that might well have, a, have an impact. Oh, this is an excellent question. How do you balance cutting meadows and leaving plant stems for overwintering? So what I would say is leave an area uncut um, because, yes, that's that's really important to leave some areas for your overwintering um, insects. Um, but rotate that uncut area around. So leave a, a different area uncut every year so that it's not the same time, same bit every year. Otherwise, you'll just 
um, lose all of your wildflowers from that area. So yeah, that's a that's a good point. Oh, um, what would I say are the worst plants for pollinators? Biodiversity that people buy for their gardens. Well, actually, um, quite a lot. The pollinators need to be able to get to at the um, um, nectar and pollen. So they need quite simple flowers. So the single flowers. So things that are highly bred to have sort of double flowers. So some of the roses and you can get hollyhocks like that as well. Um, uh, obviously, lots of people um, think think they're lovely, but I think the single flowers are actually much nicer. Um, so the double flowered varieties are of no use to pollinating insects. So um, I'd avoid those ones um, if at all possible. Um, how do I? Someone's asked if they how to set up a bee line project where they live. Um, well, you uh, I, we don't have a um, a template. Um, but I'm more than happy to give some advice on contacting your council. Um, that's no problem at all. Um, I think that if you want to set up a beeline project, um, find somewhere that you think you would like to do it and sort of find the people that are, are managing it would be um, my advice. Brilliant. Well, that looks as if that's all the questions in, um, in the questions and answers. So thanks for all of those. Hopefully, um, that's a bit more inf information I've been able to give you on answering those. So um, thank you very much.